Hey everyone, and welcome to my second of two videos on this, the Canon EOS Rebel 2000. In the first video, we talked about how what everything on the camera is, and in this video, we're gonna talk about how to use it all, but you can't do anything with this camera without batteries. It's fully electronic. So, to get to the battery chamber, which is right here, you find this little clip and with your fingernail or a key or whatever, just push it out towards the outside of the camera and open it up and there's the batteries. Now, it takes this camera takes two CR2 batteries and there's a guide on the battery chamber door so that you can see how to load them. The one that's on the bottom of your screen goes positive terminal up and the one that goes on the, what's the, closer to the top of your screen goes negative terminal up. And if you load these the wrong way like I'm doing right now, you cannot close the battery chamber door. So if you're having trouble closing the battery chamber door, double check that you loaded them correctly, okay? A note on batteries, whatever kind of CR2 you buy, make sure that it's from a reputable brand. I personally almost always use Duracell. These are Sanyo's, it was what I was able to get when I needed these. They're also very good. Energizers are very good. Uh, just get them from a reputable brand. If you were to buy one of the no-name fly-by-night brands from everybody's favorite online mega retailer, those have a higher probability of leaking or bursting when they're inside of your camera, and that will ruin your camera. So it is cheaper to buy good batteries, because they last a pretty decent amount of time, than it is to buy a new camera because you bought cheap batteries. So that's a, a just a free tip right there. So you have them loaded like this. Positive terminal matches the indicator, negative terminal matches the indicator, and the battery door just closes shut, just like that. It is, by the way, as these age, a good idea to not just press the battery door shut, but to pull the clip back, lower it into place, and then let the clip uh, slide into its locking position because uh, these clips are plastic, and one of the weaknesses in these cameras is these clips right here, and also these hinges to a lesser extent. But if these break, then you just have to get a new one, take the base off the camera, swap a new one, and it's, it's not hard, it just takes a few minutes. Okay, now that we've got batteries in the camera, we're gonna be able to start using it pretty soon, but first we wanna talk about how to change lenses, because one of the benefits of an interchangeable lens camera is you can, that's right, change the lenses. So to remove the lens, we're going to push down on the lens release button right here with our, like this. We're going to rotate the lens counter or anti-clockwise around about a quarter of a turn, and we can remove it. To mount a lens, we're going to find the red dot here and the red dot here and line those up. And the lens will drop into place nicely, and then we turn it until it clicks. So when the lens has clicked into place, then you know it's not going to go anywhere and it's ready to go. The electronic contacts are lined up. That's how you change the lenses. The next thing we're going to do is load film. You can't take any photos unless you have film in the camera. So to load the film, here's the, the motion that you want. You want to hold the film so that it's got the nub side pointed to the bottom of the camera and you're going to line, angle it in Let's try that without the door closing on my hand. I'm gonna angle it in like this, rotate the film so that the leader's over the back of the camera, and pull out a leader just like that. And this is what the camera should look like when the film is properly loaded. If you have pulled out too much of a leader, let's say like this, and the film's popped out of the back of the camera like that, that will not work. The camera's gonna jam, or at minimum will not take the film up on the take-up spool. So to correct that, we're just gonna hold the cassette here. We're gonna push some of this leader right back in, and then we're gonna pull it out so that it's nice and flat and lined up with the film leader placement index. Now we close the back of the camera. There we go. And when we turn it on, it's going to advance through the whole roll of film. That's really quick. I just filmed the EOS Rebel G video uh, like an hour ago. That is so much faster than the Rebel G is. So, film is one and done. It can record light a single time in a controlled manner through a proper shutter speed and aperture setting, or in an uncontrolled manner like this. 
if you were to open up your film right now like this, all of the film that's outside of the cassette, which is all of it because we just loaded the film, would be erased. You would get no photos on that roll of film because film's emulsion, once it records light, cannot do it again. Or if it does, it will do it until it gets completely black like this is now and will not record any more light. Okay. So, but I wanted you to see how the film looks when it's inside of the camera so you kind of understand what's going on. This take-up spool over here grabs the film when you close the door and just pulls it until all of it is outside of this cassette right here. And then as you take photos, the camera rewinds it into this cassette. Now, if we were to push the film rewind button here, let's say we got halfway through the roll of film and we decided we just wanted to finish for the day. We weren't going to use this camera again or we finished the shoot and we need to just get the film developed for the client whatever it is we're going to hold this button down and it will rewind the film and you can see the rewind going right there so basically when you're using film what happens is that the the camera pulls out the film all the way and then it rewinds it back into the camera as you take photos so Basically, you're going to get 36, well, 24 or 36 exposures, depending on how many of the um, things, frames you have. That's the word I'm looking for. Frames are on your roll of film. Uh, this, I am, I am all kinds of discombobulated with this video. Anyway, so that's how you load and unload film in this camera. Uh, if you were to just shoot 36 or 24 exposures normally, when you got down to one, you'd push the, the button one more time, and then it would just very quickly finish off that rewinding that roll of film. You could just open the back, pop it out, and put in a new roll of film and keep going. Next thing we're going to talk about is the mode dial, which is this guy right here. So what the mode dial does is allow you to control how the camera functions. Since we're there right now, it makes sense for us to start on red L, which is lock. This turns off the camera so it can't be used. We're going to go all the way up here to the top of the camera, the ISO setting. Now, when you put a roll of film into the back of the camera, as we just did, the DX code will read the DX code on the roll of film, which is this right here. And that will tell the camera what the film's ISO is. And that um, then the camera will work accordingly. If you have a roll of film that doesn't have an, a DX code on it, which some of them don't, you'd come in here to ISO and you could manually adjust using the command wheel the ISO setting. Okay, that's neat, but my roll of film has a DX code. It's, it's 400, but oh, I'd really like to shoot some sports. If only I could push it to 1600. Well, you can. You can override the DX code setting by coming into ISO and manually setting a different DX code. You could push your 400 speed film to 800 or 1600. You could pull your 100 ISO film to 25 or something like that, just to see how it would perform differently when it receives too much or too little light and is developed differently accordingly. ADEP is the automatic depth of field setting. Now what this does is this is going to use your autofocus points. Now, if you remember from our handy dandy display of the viewfinder right here, we have these seven autofocus points on inside the camera. ADEP will use data from these seven autofocus points to figure out what aperture is needed to get the closest thing and the furthest thing in focus. So if you have a group of friends standing in a row like this and you line each of their faces up with an autofocus point, it's going to try to get all of them in focus, okay? And if they're standing like, let's say, uh, one behind the other, like in, a, in an angle, then the camera will know that and it will figure out the, the aperture needed to get them all in focus. You can also use it for things like landscapes where you have a foreground object in distant mountains or something like that as well. So that's what ADEP does. In manual focus mode, you control the aperture and the shutter speed. Now, I think in the first video, I forgot to tell you what all the stuff on the back is. So while we're here, asterisk button for auto exposure lock, AV button for changing the aperture value or exposure value, depending on what you want to call it. It is actually called the exposure value. But in this mode, if you're in manual and you adjust the command wheel, it adjusts the shutter speed. But full manual means you can also adjust the aperture. So for that, you hold down the AV button 
and now you can adjust the aperture just like that. Okay. With full manual mode, when you use the light meter, it uses center weighted averaging. Now what that means is that instead of the evaluative meter that everything else ex uses divides the scene you're seeing right now into 35 even squares. And then it takes data from those squares in different ways to calculate the proper exposure. Okay, So that gives you a very accurate exposure. In manual mode, it uses center weighted, meaning that the information in the center of the, of the frame is going to provide the majority of the metering information with everything else providing the minority. Now, I couldn't find what that split is for this camera, but generally speaking, not 100% not uh, all the time, but Canon tends to go with 75%, 25%. Many cameras, uh, camera makers go with 60-40, for instance, there's also 70-30 that doesn't matter really, does not matter what the exact uh, percentage split is. The point is that if you center frame your subjects, then center weighted in full manual is gonna work pretty well for you. Center weighted as a general rule is also a really good general metering mode. So with manual, whatever you set for aperture and shutter speed, the camera's gonna do it. It does not care if that's correct or not. So when you, we look on the viewfinder, on the LCD screen here rather, you can see that underneath, let me try, maybe if I don't have glare on the view on the screen, that will work better. You can see here that there are some, there, there's a moving dot underneath that scale. That scale is your, your exposure scale. So in manual mode, you wanna try to get that moving dot over to where it's underneath the zero. That's pretty close, or right right there, is, that's good. That's a proper exposure. And you can do that by adjusting the, the shutter speed or the aperture. And whatever your settings are, your camera's gonna use them. If it's a proper exposure, great. You're gonna get a great exposure. If your image is way underexposed or way overexposed, the camera's gonna do it anyway because you told it to. So full manual mode gives you a ton of control, but you also need to make sure you're reading your light meter before you take your photo. AV, TV, and P are the semi-automatic modes. AV stands for aperture value or aperture priority, TV for time value or shutter priority, and P for program. In, aperture val in AV, when you adjust the command wheel, now it's changing the aperture, okay? In TV, it adjusts the shutter speed. So that's the only difference between AV and TV. And it's going to work to give you a proper sh uh, proper exposure, as you can see here, because as I move the aperture, the camera's gonna pick a shutter speed for me that's gonna give me a proper exposure. But you know what? Um, I'm in a setting where I really want to intentionally overexpose my image, but I really like using aperture value. I don't wanna go to the hassle of full manual. How do I do that? It's pretty easy. Push the AV button down on the back, and now you can force the camera to overexpose by a stop, or maybe two stops, or if you need a darker exposure, you can force it to underexpose by up to two stops. So in AV mode and TV mode, you can force your camera to do something a little bit different than it might necessarily want to. In TV mode, when you select the shutter speed, the camera will pick an aperture for you. In either mode, AV or TV, if the, the data point that you can't control is flashing, that means that your camera cannot give you a proper exposure with the lens or shutter speeds or lighting that you have at your disposal. So right now, with the lighting in the studio here and my hand kind of hovering over the front of the lens, at 1 500th of a second, I would probably need something like an F03 lens to get a proper exposure on this uh, with my settings. Uh, but if there were more light, then that would stop flashing or if I adjust the shutter speed. So that's what the flashing means. In program mode, the camera is going to pick the best shutter speed and aperture combination for your scene based on what it thinks is in front of it. So program mode is a really good way to learn your camera when you get it for the first time, and then you can move into some of these modes over here to start understanding how your settings affect your images. With program mode, you can also force your camera to overexpose or underexpose your images, just like you can in AV and TV. L 
is off, we talked about. Magical green box. Let's talk about the green box. This is what's called full auto or sometimes auto plus. I forget exactly what the term is for it in uh, with the Canon EOS 2000. But what this does is take all the control out of your hands. It will even pop up the flash for you. With program mode, you have to tell it when the fl you want the flash to, to pop up by hitting the flash release button. But in green box mode, you can't pop up the flash yourself. The camera will decide for you when you need to use the flash. Okay. This scene mode right here is called portrait mode. Portrait mode is a mode that's designed for taking portraits. It's really, they kind of made that a, a mystery, didn't they? Anyway, the, the way that this works is it's designed to have a human subject and then isolate your human subject from the background by giving you a blurry background in your image. So this works best at the long range of your zoom lens, just like this. It will give you a, a slightly fast aperture, probably close to wide open on the kit lens. And you can make this more successful by having your subject 9 to 10 or more feet in front of the background because that will give you a blurrier background. Landscape mode here does something that's basically the opposite. It works best at the wide end of your zoom or with a wide angle lens. What this does is it gives you a small aperture to try to get as much as possible in focus. Everything from something very close to something that's uh, like a mountain range or a cityscape that's off at infinity focus. So that's what this does. Generally speaking, if I understand correctly, if I, or if I recall correctly, landscape will not fire the flash. Next mode is the uh, close-up mode. Close-up, I also think, does not fire the flash. This works best at 50 millimeters and beyond, especially at the longer range of your zoom. And what this is designed for is to have your camera be as close as possible to your subject so that it can take a photo as a close-up. Kind of mysterious how they named all of these things. It's like they're trying to keep a secret, isn't it? No, it's not. They're actually, one of the things Canon does very well is name things so that you know exactly what they do. So good on them for that. Next up is sports. And sports is good for longer lenses, either the long end of your kit lens or if you have an 80 to 200 millimeter lens, the long end of that. This will shoot as close to wide open as possible to give you the fastest shutter speed it can give you so that it can freeze motion. This works very well with fast film like 400 and faster. And this last one here is called night portrait mode. And this is a bit of a weird sort of thing to use. And it's got one case. So let's say you're out and there's like a cityscape behind you and you're with a friend and you want to take a photo of them with the cityscape behind them. What you'd do is you'd have them stand in front of the, or sit in front of the camera. And this would take a long exposure that would also fire the flash. And that would illuminate your friend and give a long enough exposure that the city lights behind them would also be illuminated. So you can make this successful by telling your friend not to move until after the photo has been taken. Because if they move during the photo, then what's going to happen is that the lights that were behind them will show through them uh, even, after the, even though the flash was used. Uh, the, the camera will record those lights, and that's just going to look kind of weird. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about every, all of the different stuff on, on this side of the camera. But before we do that, let's take a look at the LCD screen and figure out what everything is. So here's a photo of the LCD screen off of, of, one, of the, one of these cameras and all of the different, and I, I went through and then I recreated what the LCD screen would look like in Affinity Design with all of the different things on it. And that's why, even though everything's here, it looks a little bit different than what the actual screen looks like in terms of, like, these aren't italics, and also everything's super, super crisp because um, I do this stuff at ultra high res. Anyway, um, over here, these four digits right here, these are your shutter speeds. So, so your shutter speed settings up here, this is your aperture. This is your ISO setting. So when you manually set your ISO, this will light up and then your ISO will be displayed here. This indicator tells you that you're in manual focus. These are your autofocus points and these will light up to tell you which autofocus points are being used, not actively, but which ones can be used by the camera, or in just a minute when we see how to adjust autofocus points, which one you've selected. 
self timer indicator. If you're going to use a self timer, this will be on. Frame counter. This will count up to 36 and will display the frames, the, the frame that you're on. Low battery indicator. If you, this low battery indicator is on, it means your batteries are almost dead. If you just put fresh batteries in and this is on, it means there's a problem with your electronics and your camera is probably dead or you've got bad batteries. One of the issues that some of these have had over the years is that um, the electronics falsely show dead batteries when the batteries are new. That's not something that I'm, I know of to be repairable. This here is your film indicator. If this is on and blinking, it means that you're out of film. This is your light meter right here from two stops under to two stops overexposed with an indicator for where that is uh, as, you're using the, as you're adjusting your exposure. And then these four triangles here, as we adjust the functions, which we'll see in a few minutes, tell you which of the functions that you are using. And if they're illuminated when you're not adjusting a function, it tells you that that function is on and active to a setting which is not the default. So knowing all of that, let's go in here and start talking about what these different buttons are. We're going to start with the autofocus point selection. Now when I push this, you're going to notice that the autofocus point, uh, autofocus indicator over here is the only thing we see. As I rotate the command wheel, we can scroll through the autofocus points and have it, the camera will either automatically select the one that's best, or we can force it to select a specific autofocus point. Yeah, okay, that's great, but why would we want to do that? So let's say that you're looking through your viewfinder right here, okay? And you have forced it to select this autofocus point right here. Now, let's assume that you are at, let's say, uh, you're out watching your dog play in the yard, okay? And you want to get a photo where your dog's running through the frame this way, in focus here, and they're running towards this open area in the frame over here, because that's a, a good and pleasing composition. You can force this autofocus point to be active and then track your dog keep your dog here in this autofocus point the camera will focus on it and then you can take photos of your dog tracking your dogs it runs through the yard and that puts your dog over here with space to run in the frame okay that's fun and all but what if i wanted to do a portrait shoot let's say you had this one or this one here active you could set up your lighting to be the same for every shot then you could set up your camera in a fixed position put it onto manual mode and use just one autofocus point with portrait orientation. Put all of your subjects faces right here on this autofocus point or the bridge of their nose or something like that. And then you know everyone's going to be in focus. All the settings will be exactly the same. All the lighting will look exactly the same and you will have the proper focus for every person. So that's just another example of how specifying your autofocus point can be useful for your photography. Okay, so that's your autofocus point selection. We're going to skip the functions for, the, for a second. We're going to come back and do those in just a minute because these have the most things in this screen. Next, we're going to do the self-timer. If you push the self-timer button and then push the shutter button, you can see here that the self-timer light is blinking a countdown, and that's going to let you know that the self-timer is active. It'll go solid once it's almost done, and then it will take a photo. So that's how you keep track of the self-timer. When you're done, make sure to turn the self-timer off. It doesn't automatically reset. All right, so let's do the function buttons next. So we push the function button, and that's going to bring up these arrows here that we can scroll through Oops, with the function button to adjust different things. So this first one is red-eye reduction, 0 and 1. With 1, if you're taking pictures of people, the flash will pulse before the actual photo is taken so that people's pupils close down and you get less of a red reflection off of the blood vessels in the back of their retinas. And you can see that because I left uh, red eye reduction as on, that little triangle is visible next to that symbol. So we'll turn it off. We'll go to this next one, which is beep. Beep on or off. If you turn that on, your camera will beep as you count down this, as it counts down the self timer. Okay, just as a heads up, and uh, yeah. The next one here is your multiple exposures, and you can set this to up to nine exposures on the same frame. Uh, we'll talk about exactly how to do multiple exposures at the end of this video, but this is how you access it. Well, I'll set it to two really quickly, and then you can see, as you take your second exposure, it will 
advance the film after your, after your multiple exposure is done and then automatically reset so you're not doing that with every image. Oops. Last one here is auto exposure bracketing. Now if we select this and rotate the command dial, you can see here that it's going to create three dots under the, um, under the meter read, uh, readout. That represents three photos one that's properly exposed, one that in this case is one and a half stops under, and one that is one and a half stops over. That's what this one and a half up here means, and that's what these three dots down here at the bottom mean, okay? So what this can be good for is, let's say you're not sure exactly what settings you need, and you're not sure that your camera's reading the scene correctly, so you wanna take a couple of safety shots just to make sure one of them turns out well. You can use bracketing for that. Okay, but like, I know that I'm not going to need an overexposure. I think I need something that's a little bit darker. I want a bracket for that. Oh, you can do that. So if we go back in here, we hold the AV button. You can now shift. Oh, come on. Okay. So we've got the, the bracketing set up. If we hit the AV button while we're here, we can force the camera to shift the bracketing around. So if we want to have the third image be properly exposed, we can do that. If we want to have it spaced evenly, but have two of them biased towards darker, we can do that as well. So uh, that's a trick you can do with bracketing that is useful, to say the least. When you're done, you'll just want to turn it back off and go back to single frame shooting. So understanding all of that, Let's take a look at what is in your viewfinder on your Canon EOS 2000. So if you were to look through your camera's viewfinder, you'd see something like this. Now I mocked this up again in uh, Affinity Design, so it doesn't look exactly right, like I didn't get the fonts correct, but all of the information is here. These are your autofocus points, as we've talked about multiple times. This is your focusing area. The actual image will be slightly outside of that focusing area. This asterisk means that you are using FE lock, or I'm sorry, AE lock, auto exposure lock, when you, uh, when you see it. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. This right here is your flash indicator. There are two indicators. The lightning bolt, or arrow, whatever it is, indicates that flash will be used. H indicates that high speed sync will be used. Some of the Canon uh, speed lights support high speed sync with this camera. I don't know which ones. These eight, uh, these four number eights here are where your shutter speed will be. Aperture. This is your autofocus readout exactly as we saw it just a couple of moments ago on the top LCD screen. And what this does is this will light up the number of autofocus points and this, the, which specific one or ones the camera is going to use to focus. So if you have only the central autofocus point lit up, only this autofocus point right here is gonna be used by the camera to obtain focus. This is the light meter display as we saw on the LCD screen. Exactly the same information that we just saw for obtaining a proper exposure or um, having bracketing, things like that. And then there's a circle over here and when that lights up, that means that you are going to have a um, something be in focus. Okay, so that's what that means. Okay. Now that we've talked about a bunch of this stuff so far, let's talk about how to use the flash on this camera. So before we get too far in, you can put the flash up here on the hot shoe and any Xenon flash, which is like this one right here that has a bulb that gets reused over and over again, will work on this camera. Uh, Canon speed lights do work very, very well. They are designed to work with these. So if you can get your hands on one that is fully compatible with this, go for it. You can also use the pop-up uh, pop flash like this, okay? The flash sync speed on this camera, and with many of the Canon speed lights, it will communicate with the camera and automatically set your flash sync speed correctly. But let's say you're using a, uh, an old time flash with just a single contact on it that doesn't communicate with your camera, or you're using an RF adapter, okay? Your flash sync speed is 1 90th of a second. And the reason for what that means is that 1 90th of a second is the fastest speed at which you can use a flash with this camera. Now the way that your shutter curtain works, you actually have two curtains. The first one opens when the photo starts and then the second one closes as it ends and then they reset like that. 
So at 1 90th of a second, the first curtain opens, the entire area of the film is exposed to light for a 90th-ish of a second, and then the second curtain closes and they reset. If you are taking a three-second exposure, the first curtain opens, then there, the entire film is open to light for three seconds, and then the second one closes and then they reset. Okay. But what if you're taking a 1 1,000th of a second exposure? That's much faster than 1 90th. The first curtain opens, and then the second one follows right behind it. So you don't ever have the entire film open to light for that whole time. You just have a slit traveling over the film. So if you use a flash that's not a high-speed sync with a 1 1,000th or anything faster than 1 90th of a second shutter speed, part of the frame is going to be blocked by the shutter and you won't have full frame illumination with your flash. Now some basic tips on how to use a flash effectively. This right here is the absolute worst possible alignment for a flash, having it right on top of your lens and centered like this. What this will do is send your light out from the flash like this. It will reach your subject, bounce back, and your subject will look very flat and waxy because they're hitting, being hit by basically a wall of photons that just bounces back. If you think about the way that we see people when we're outside, or trees or buildings outside, or when we're talking to a friend in the hallway inside, the sun is above us when we're outdoors, or the moon at night, or overhead lighting if we're on the street, like street lights, or if we're indoors, the lights above us. We see things lit from above, and our brains are wired to say, hey, this thing's lit from above, it looks normal and flattering. That's why if you've ever seen old, seen old film noir movies, oftentimes the villains are lit from below. It makes them look evil, and, uh, you know, so at any rate, with a flash, you will set your photos up to be flattering to your subjects if you replicate that. So if you put a flash on top of your camera like this, the best thing you can do is get a flash that, bounce, that will tilt the head upward like this to bounce the flash off of the ceiling because that will have the light leave the flash, reach the ceiling, go back to your subject, bounce off your subject, and then go back to your lens. And when that happens, now you're using your flash to replicate overhead lighting that people will see as flattering. Okay, um, but I don't have a ceiling. Well, in that case, it's a good idea to get a flash that has an articulating head so it can tilt and rotate like that okay and when you rotate your flash head then you can bounce your flash off of a wall or a reflector or something like that and that's a really good way to take control of your flash now this being an autofocus camera what you can also do is put a little RF transmitter up here get an RF receiver down here and now you can handhold your flash wherever you want it let the autofocus do the focus. Hold your flash up and up into the side, and then you can really sculpt the light by having your flash anywhere. As long as it's pointing down, it's going to create some natural looking lighting. So there are a lot of different ways you can use a flash, but the general point is that if you can get it to bounce down onto your subjects, that's going to work really well. If you can't, then getting it to bounce off of a wall and to your subjects is also going to work really well. So the next function we're going to talk about here is the auto exposure lock, and that's the asterisk button right here. Now this is a toggle switch, not a button you have to hold down. And what this does is when you push this down, the camera is going to use partial metering. Now what partial metering is, we're going to go back here to this, to this display, and partial metering means that an area about this size right here is going to be used for your metering information. It's basically the central autofocus points, right? All of the metering information is coming from that area right there. And the uh, camera is going to lock that, that metering data in while you compose your image. So what you want to do to make the most out of auto exposure lock, and this a good situ situation for, for where this would work, Let's say that you're out with a friend and you're hiking in the forest, right? And there's a big open valley behind your friend, uh, but they're standing in the shade of a tree. You can put your, their face 
in the central autofocus area of your, of your viewfinder, push the auto exposure lock button. That's going to lock in those exposure settings, regardless of what setting you have on the mode dial. It locks in those settings with a meter reading that's 100% based on your friend's face. Then you step back, compose your image as you want it to be, and take the photo. And auto exposure lock, which by the way does not work in manual because you have manual settings that you do yourself, uh, but in all of these semi-automatic and scene modes, auto exposure lock works properly. Uh, and then what you do is you will uh, recompose your image and your friend will be properly exposed and the rest of the scene might be a little bit overexposed, but that's okay because your friend is what you want to have the photo be of. So that's a really good example of how uh, auto exposure lock works and just bear in mind when you use this that only the center of the image is going to be used for metering input. So now that we've seen how all of the different functions on this camera work, let's put them all together and take a photo. You've got a battery, you've got film, you've got lens, you've selected which mode you're going to shoot in, okay? You've dialed in whatever settings you need to dial in. Your camera's switched to autofocus if you want to use autofocus. It's going to obtain focus and that's it. It takes a picture. The way that this camera is designed is the actual act of taking a photo should be very quick. What you're going to do beforehand is get everything configured as you want so that it knows what to do when you go to actually take the photo and then just takes a photo. Cool. What about double exposures? Well, we know from looking at these icons right here that there is a double exposure function. So we talked about it a bit. Nope, this is how we do it. There we go. It's almost there. We're going to select two images for a double exposure. You could do up to nine, but we're going to do two. First thing we're going to do is talk about the process of it, then we're going to talk about the science of it and how to use double exposures in different modes. Process is you line up your first shot in your double exposure, and then you line up your second shot in your double exposure, and you've taken a double exposure. But the science is, let's say that you are taking a photo and you need 1 1 25th of a second and f five, six. Oh, we'll, we'll do eight. It's a little bit easier to do eight with this lens. Okay. So one one twenty-fifth of a second and f8 are a proper exposure for a single exposure. The way that film works is that it can record a certain number of photons once. So if you hit it with double the number of photons that it's designed to record, you're going to end up with a negative that's what's called thick, dense, or dark. What, those are three words that mean the same thing. Your film received too much light, if you scan it, you're going to get digital noise and low contrast. If you print it in a dark room, you're going to have long print times and low contrast. So you want to have your double exposure still put the proper number of photons on your film. Okay, how do we do that? Well, in manual mode, it's really easy. If we know that 1 1 25th and F8 is a proper exposure, we just have to cut the amount of light in half. And the easiest way to do that is to go to 1 2 50th of a second. The shutter speeds are fractions, so the higher the number, when we're talking about the fractions, this is anything faster than a second, the higher the number, the less time. 1 2 50th is half as much time as 1 1 25th, half as much light. With aperture, it's a little bit different. You're gonna go up one stop. 1 1 25th to 1 2 50th is one stop. F8 to F11 is one stop. Yeah, it's uh, hard for me to read this the, uh, from, from my angle. Anyway, you could also set go from F8 to F11. One stop in the aperture on this camera is two clicks of the uh, command wheel. So you can that's how you do it in manual mode. Uh, you know, that's, that's great, but I really, I like shooting in aperture priority. I don't like shooting in manual at all. Also, really easy to do. We're going to hit the AV button. We're going to force the camera to underexpose the image by one stop. We're going to shift the exposure to under by one. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to select two for our double exposure. And now we have two shots, both underexposed by one stop. And that results in a single proper multiple exposure. After we're done, we're going to go back to having a proper exposure, otherwise all the rest of our shots will be uh, a little bit dark. So, 
but what if you don't want the images to be taken like right in rapid succession? Well, you don't have to. Just leave it one stop under until you take your second photo. So let's say you were going to go take a building, of a, a photo of a statue, okay? And if you take a photo of a statue at sunset, then you get really nice blues and reds in the sky behind it. But if you take the photo after dark, then you get spotlights shining up onto the statue. Okay, that's pretty neat. It would be awesome if we could put both of those in one frame. Set up your tripod, take your first shot underexposed at sunset, then just hang out until it's dark and the lights go on, take your second shot. Honestly, in that setting, you could probably just do them both at proper exposure, but let's not discuss that too much. That's overly complicated. Anyway, the basic idea for a double exposure in any of the modes other than manual is to force the camera to underexpose by a stop for both photos. And that's how you do a double exposure with the Canon EOS Rebel 2000. And guess what? With that, yeah, we've covered everything. So, hope this video was helpful, and uh, I will see you in future camera manuals.